Hi everybody! So if you think of Stirling engines, which I understand some people don't, but if you do, you probably think of something like this. It was invented by a Scotsman called Robert Stirling in 1816. It works because you heat one side. As you heat one side, the gas expands because of the heat and that's connected to what's called the power piston. The expanding gas pushes the power piston, the power piston is attached to a crankshaft and the crankshaft is also attached to something called the displacer piston. So as the power piston goes up, the displacer piston goes down. It goes down to fill the hot area, forcing the hot gas into the cold side. Now the heat is transferred away and of course the gas contracts. The contraction of the gas pulls on the power piston and this cycle repeats. Now it's worth noting that it doesn't actually need a fire, it just needs a hot side and a cold side. Anything that can provide a hot and a cold will make a sterling engine work. So if you point the sun at this, it'll work. If you stick it on the palm of your hand, it'll work. Just anything. What matters is that the gas is being used to carry the work of the heat from the hot to the cold and turn it into mechanical work. But the gas, in this case air, is a working fluid. The engine itself is just an arrangement of capturing that work in the working fluid and changing it into something that's much easier to use, in our case mechanical work. But a working fluid doesn't have to be a gas. Gas has lots of problems. One thing is it leaks. Of course, a working fluid can use a fluid like oil and water, but it can also use a solid like this, rubber. Now, it's been known a long time that rubber or elastomeric solids can be used as a working fluid in engines designed to convert heat into mechanical work. But in the past, rubber heat engine cycles were not given serious consideration oh, because uh, energy alternatives are not in demand. And to be honest, the majority of people are unaware of the gas-like thermodynamic behavior of rubber. Let's have a look at the isothermal heat engine cycles for a gas and then for rubber. Incidentally, the word rubber was coined by Joseph Priestley because it was able to rub out pencil marks. But you'll notice that the two cycles are stunningly similar. The adiabatic heat engine cycles are very similar as well. Rubber is unusual in that it contracts when heated. Most materials expand. But actually, this contraction when heated is a property of most polymers and is the basis for shaped memory polymers. Now, most of the rubber heat engines you've ever seen constructed use just ordinary rubber bands, which is probably why their performance is so embarrassingly bad. Because when thinking about something like a heat engine, then the factors influencing heat transfer are the key components, and they can be grouped into three categories. Thermal properties of the material, dimensional considerations, and boundary conditions. Clearly, one big lump of rubber is going to respond very badly because rubber by itself is a heat insulator. But if you put thousands of little strands in there, then the performance is going to go up markedly. There are, of course, materials made up of thousands of different little strands. Lycra or spandex, for instance, is a very fine collection of strands bundled together to make the actual fibre that lycra is spun from. So a better option rather than rubber bands would be a bit of spandex. They have excellent aging and heat resistance, and no, not intended for use in a heat engine, they function remarkably well in such applications. Of course, you do have to wonder that if chemists were formulating for thermodynamic applications, what they would actually come up with. Now, given the chemistry of the material, the physical qualities of the material, the other great thing is, of course, heat exchange. You get the heat in there and out of there as efficiently as possible, and using things like hot and cold air blowers could well be a way forward. Now, in my research, I did come across this paper by Richard J. Farris from the University of Massachusetts in 1977, where he was able to get a density of one kilowatt per kilogram of rubber using atmospheric steam and only a 30 degree temperature difference. That's amazing stuff. Back in the early 1900s, William Wigand was a chemist and he worked in the rubber industry. Now, this was that period of time we were... <laughs> 
We didn't have our heads full of the f ideas that if you're a chemist, you can only work in chemistry. So he designed a really simple heat engine. It's actually awesome. And he built this heat engine. It's basically rubber and a pendulum. So we need to make a pendulum. And making a pendulum is not that difficult. And we need this pendulum to be something uh, on something called a knife blade bearing. So we're going to use a knife blade as the actual bearing. And what we've got to do is get that knife blade into this bit of wood it's a bit of uh, eight millimeter dowel of course if you start doing it like that you're going to be a sorry what you need to do with the knife is hold it and keep on scoring it until it starts to go through clearly working away from your hand once you start to get it through you'll be able to wiggle that knife blade in there then we can take it out of there and there we go we're inserting our knife blade and that will be the point of the bearing then we need a bit of a bob, we need a counterweight, and we need something for this to swing on. So let's get that together. Okay, so what I've got here is three discs of wood that I cut out ages ago for, uh, um, I think, one of the wind walls, actually, and I've got a ton of them. So I've drilled a slightly larger hole, and I've put a saw cut straight across the centre, because I'm going to put it on the stand like that. And here's my pendulum with its rod we pop that down rest the knife blade in those saw cuts so it won't move and there we go and we have our basic pendulum now i'm going to add that as the pendulum and that as the counterweight by drilling these out okay so there's my pendulum give that little push it's beautiful isn't it so now what we need to do is add the motor and the motor Plastic bands. Okay, so there it is. I put the rubber band motor on it. Now, what happens is the heat lamp is being shaded by the pole of the stand. So when the rubber band gets into the heat, it heats up, obviously. It heats up, it shrinks, the pendulum moves that way, and that causes that to shade it, and it cools, and the pendulum moves the other way. So the pendulum swings backwards and forwards as the rubber band is heated and cooled, and it's ex expanding and uh, contracting. Now, it's a bit difficult to see, so I'm going to give you a close-up of it so you can see the pendulum actually working. But this was one of the first rubber motors ever made. So, big whoop, eh? I mean, it's a tiny movement, but that principle can be actually used to develop into a motor. And rubber has some surprising advantages. It's actually really power dense. Farris got 800 watts per kilo. That's about half a horsepower per pound of rubber. And that's really quite high and puts it in the range of practical interest. It's good for low temperature difference heat engines. There aren't minimum or maximum operating temperatures. It can operate over a broad range of temperatures and it's a solid so it doesn't require any containment which means rubber can interact directly with the mechanical components and with the heat and cooling source. Rubber engines have high stalling and starting torque and fairly flat power curves. They're extremely simple to make and require few precision parts and that should make them easy to maintain and manufacture and would be ideal for remote operation. And of course, rubber is well suited to heat pump applications. I guess the moral of this story is that if you've been thinking about building a Stirling engine, you might want to rethink that idea a little bit and look a bit closer at this stuff. Perhaps not these. Perhaps grab yourself some Lycra and give that a go because that certainly has great properties because it is really, if you like, a Stirling engine in disguise. And it's one of those areas that we haven't really thought that much about, but has great potential. It could be very interesting indeed to see what you might discover. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.